Bob and Anthony and Mary, who's in the future in New Zealand. He's a day ahead of me. So uh, anyway, Father, good to see you again. Uh, good to be back again, uh, Steve. Thanks for inviting me in. That's great. Good to be uh, here. Like I said, anything to help you guys out. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to go with a little background of the Redemptress and, and basically the founder of who is St. Alphonsus? Okay, St. Alphonsus, um, I suppose any order loves their founder, loves their, their patron saint. So we have a great love for St. Alphonsus. And um, I'm not trying to say he's greater than any of the others, greater than all the other saints, but he is a great saint. So he's from, the, he's from Naples, born in Naples in uh, 1696. So it's just the, the end of the 17th century and beginning of the 18th when there was uh, a lot of, well, there's uh, very difficult to make foundations of religious orders uh, in spite of the, the Catholic countries that uh, he was living in. Um, so he was baptized on the 27th of September with the, uh, I haven't got all his names, but about five baptism names, Alphonsus, Mary, Anthony, Michael, Cosmos, Damien. And um, the, the priest baptizing him said that he would live to the age of 90 and become a bishop. So we already see the, the hand of God upon St. Alphonsus. Um, predicted to be you know, a great saint living to great age. It's said of him in his canonization, which is kind of going into the future, but, but that he never committed a single deliberate venial sin, which is extraordinary. You know, yeah. it's amazing that saints can even not commit a, a deliberate, well, commit a mortal sin, but St. Alphonsus, through the, uh, his confessor, who was allowed to reveal it, said he never committed a single deliberate venial sin. Okay, so he's a great saint in that, in that respect. Um, he made vows and much later on in his religious life, never to waste a moment of time. It was a new vow, a vow to always do the most perfect thing. Uh, he had vows to make save the cross every day, to pray the 15 deck of the rosary every day. The only saint in the church to make that uh, vow. Yeah. I made a vow uh, to pray the dolors of Our Lady every day, to preach on her every Saturday, to fast on bread and water in her honor every Saturday. Uh, I'm just, just from the top of my head. So, uh, a great saint. Um, he became, uh, well, he was the eldest of his, in his family, had a younger brother, Hercules. So, he should have received the inheritance from his father, but uh, he became a priest and had great difficulties to leave the, the family uh, home because he was so extraordinary. Uh, at the age of 16, he was a doctor of both civil and canon law. Okay, so just imagine a 16-year-old, just a young lad who's there in the bar. He receives his, his cope and his hat, and it's all too big for him. But he becomes one of the greatest lawyers of uh, the time there and defends cases and never loses a single case until um, this, his conversion, which is when he did lose a case. But... Uh, through recent study, it's shown that um, th when he, he made it, he made his whole case and like it was just absolutely flawless and he was going to win. And then uh, what the opponents said to something, uh, I forget, some something about the case and St. Alphonsus, it, almost like he had, m had missed a point, but he hadn't. The reality was, says, look, no matter what you do, you're going to lose because this case is rigged. Basically, was the, what what we said, and so Saint Francis said, "Well, you know, law courts. I know you now. Will you? I know you. You'll see me no more." And so he leaves, and he, and he, he becomes a priest, um, and then gets chosen by our Lord to found the Redemptress, and that's uh, where his his vocation with the religious life begins. And it's uh, through the, the the visions of Sister Maria Celeste across the Rosa. I think I may have said this already, but he, mm -hmm. you know, he. Um, verifies that her visions are correct and he's chosen to begin the redemptress and the idea is to go in out to the most abandoned souls and so he's just totally on fire for the salvation of souls and that um fire still lasts today and you can it's seen in his books okay so he wrote um 111 different titles some of them were just pamphlets you know like you know, 10 20 pages other mm -hmm. Big books. I've got a few that uh, are, you know, 
have been available in the past through tanned books and publishers. And you know, this one of Dignity as a Priest is quite well worn, missing <laughs> bits of the, uh, the cover. The Glories of Mary, uh, one of his most extraordinary books. Um, and our Blessed Lady, books on the Passion. And then they're quite well known generally in the traditional Catholic world and even broader to that. So these works of St. Francis. And the thing about his writing is that it's, it's easy to read. It's enjoyable to read. It is um, to the point. It's clear. Um, it's deep as well. You know, so uh, I must admit like this, I've read his works in the past and really appreciated them. And then, you know, as you grow in the spiritual life, you read them again, you say, okay, I know it. That's what he was meaning there. And that's, okay, that's what he meant there. And you can see this depth that he's able to put in these books, which you don't maybe appreciate the first time you read them, but you get to see it. So um, this ability to, to communicate his love for God and to communicate his desire of the salvation of souls that we want to love God and save our souls. So um, that's the re relevance of St. Francis today. So his books, um, they were taken up by this priest called Father Ronald Tangen, and he had a project to produce hundreds of thousands. And uh, I think it was in the 19, it was when I was at the seminary, I don't know if that's the first time he did it, but I was at the seminary in the 1980s. Uh, just check when this was reprinted. Oh, I can't remember now. Anyway, so he printed like, you know, it says in this one volume, 175,000 books, oh, wow. I know, in one <laughs> go. And then he printed, did a reprint of 150,000 and did reprint. And so St. Alphonse's books are actually, you know, all around the English speaking world um, generally, and they can still be got. We've put them up onto our. Uh, a website called at the Alfonsianum. You can put a link to that, I'm sure. Yeah. So I'm just, I don't know if I'm going, <laughs> sticking to the point, but just speaking about St. Alphonse, I just I no, do love him. Yeah. Right? Great I, I did hear that he was uh, called a Mary worshiper because of that one book. <laughs> yeah, well, the thing is, you know, in spite of being a whole lot of, there'd be a lot of books on Our Blessed Lady, there was uh, this chap at the time that he was talking about you know, people that can have too much devotion to Our Lady and they're kind of worshipping and all that type of thing. But he wrote this, The Glories of Mary, um, in, 19, in 1750. So he was already, you know, like, it's, it's actually his first book is The Glories of Mary. So he started writing when he's in his 50s, which is extraordinary because at that stage he was, you know, already found founded the congregation, was a busy man preaching the missions, all that type of thing. And he begins his writing and then he writes 111 titles. Uh, on just about every possible subject. But the, the glories of Mary, I mean, I could maybe do a whole talk on that because I did do one um, about 20 years ago in France, in fact, at a, a Marian Congress. And I, uh, it was in French, uh, in France. But, you know, the glories of Mary is just taking the Salve Regina, which mm -hmm. is the prayer of the church, and just explaining it, you know, to the faithful. And it's, it's, yeah, it's a beautiful book, really, really nourished so many souls. And given such a love for St. Francis, and they say it's the most well-known book on Our Lady in the Catholic Church. I believe it, yeah. I'm, I remember me being coming out of sports, and I was always liking the Hall of Famers. They always told us to read, you know, going into basketballs, reading Larry Bird. I still got the book. It's something yeah. about the drive. I wanted to learn what these guys did. So when going into church, I heard about this guy, Alphonsus, from one of his sermons reading it he like quotes the hall of famers the saints and yeah just, yeah that was amazing to me so that's the, that's the, his his ability some people have called him an um i forget what the word they just said that he you know he couldn't write anything so he just had to copy the saints but it's 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 not that at all he had such an ability to hide himself his humility was so great that he didn't want to just say something as if he is saying it even though he's adopted the church now and you know one of the greatest saints so in a certain sense, he had this incredible ability to hide behind what all these different other holy people and saints were saying. And so you see in his in every one of his books, you know, the amount of quotes that are there are in a, of saints saying things. So he's, he knew so much, had read so, so much that he was able to write his book almost by just quoting this saint, that writer, this thing, and, you know, just produce these incredible works. It was actually, it was his humility 
rather than you know what some people said oh his inability to you know to say anything himself i mean of course he did say things himself he wrote the moral theology things like that but yeah there's an extraordinary number of um saints that are quoted from fathers priests uh, theologians all that type of thing and then he in the glories of me is wonderful he gives these stories and they're not stories because they, they, they're the real facts that happened but absolutely extraordinary and um a priest well, a group of theologians i mean went so as far as i'm aware saint Alphonse wrote everything from memory mm -hmm. okay so he never had any books around he just wrote everything all his quotes are from memory and they checked every single quote in in the glories of me there's thousands and they couldn't find i think there's one that was maybe just slightly off but otherwise every single quote was correct and to the point and, and so it's it's amazing just you know it's amazing that he was able to do all of this um and so you know he had a great mind great memory oh yes yeah yeah maybe ne maybe maybe next month we'll do something on glorious of mary that's yeah piqued my interest <laughs> okay yeah. i mean i've read yeah. it a couple of times yes yeah, by far it's amazing but um so alphonsus uh traveled the diocese didn't he too to preach right so he began so I think I said this last time, his, the aim of the congregation is to preach to the most abandoned. And so those were the, 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 the poor people living in the countryside in the hills um, who were neglected by these priests who were basically priests, not because they necessarily loved the salvation of souls or that type of thing, but were just looking, you know, it was like a job for them. They, they did earn a, a kind of salary. And there were thousands of priests in Naples itself, but hardly any in the countryside. So they weren't really going out. So our Lord wanted this congregation to begin, uh, which would go out to the most abandoned, preach to them in a simple manner that faith and lead them to the love of God. So, yes, he would go around the diocese and preach a mission, a mission which was a time of extraordinary grace where they would preach the eternal truth, just get people onto this reality. I've got a soul. I need to save my soul. And there is a hell. There is a heaven. Um, there is death. There is judgment. And so uh, just getting those things clearly into people's minds, that's the fundamental, the basis of our whole faith is to, that's what, we get, that's what we're aiming at. If I save my soul, I've done everything I need to do. If I don't save my soul, then it doesn't matter what I've done in the world or what happens because it's just, so once you've got that base basis formed among in the people, they can then advance spiritually and, and otherwise. So he'd go around the diocese preaching these missions and uh, working extraordinary miracles of conversion, of grace, and word got around. And so he didn't have to promote them. It was just everybody wanted the missions because they were just doing so much good around the diocese and they could see souls you know converting turning to the to god turning to the faith and so that would be it we just it go as in you know, a group of missionaries in that mm -hmm. state that didn't have any means of transport and, and they wouldn't use horses so they used to walk and you know, can imagine this kind of group of whatever five ten missionary monks walking into the city you know, and they'd have a big crucifix and that would be planted in the, you know, the, the town place. And then they go to the church and begin the mission and preach. And they just go around and uh, spend the, the, you know, their, their time preaching what we call the eternal truths and doing extraordinary good. Uh, yeah. Even I just got done reading a couple books on Garcia Moreno and he called the redemptress in to preach all over Ecuador. And did, right. Yeah. What you were saying about what he did then—that's exactly how they described it then. Come in, put the cross down. Everyone just flocked, converted yeah. the country. And as I said before, you know, the thing about a, a mission is that it's the whole parish that is uplifted. It's not just a small group of people that are doing a retreat. Mm -hmm. It's the whole parish, and you get that whole fervor going, and everybody sort of encourages everybody else. And um, and it is an it's time time of extraordinary grace, and particularly it's the the repairing of confessions, you know, um, it's hard to believe, but it actually is a reality where people would, you know, 
be going to confession and making bad confessions or going to confession or going to communion and making bad communions because they've made a bad confession and for years on end. And so the idea is that we came in as strangers. We didn't want to get to know the people. We don't want to get to know the people, but we're there to give them that opportunity to set themselves right with God and then carry on. And we go and we just, you know, take those, those sins with us as it were the confession. Um, so a mission does an extraordinary amount of good in, in, in a place. Was uh, his arthritis, was that a, uh, from his, the missions or was it from more of the writing? Uh, I don't know if it was, it, I think it was just a congenital thing. It was you know, to do with, you know, um, I don't think it's specifically because of one thing or another. Uh, it was just, you know, bodily health. He, he died at 90. So, you know, he wasn't, he was a, <laughs> And he, he worked, you know, right the very last, you know, day of his life, basically. So I don't know that it was specifically, you know, that's not been said specifically because of the preaching of the missions. Or that. I mean, he wore himself out, that's for sure, um, and never wasted a moment of time. Can you and, but in a... spite of... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going in spite of that, his sicknesses, he did so, so much. Um, you know, there are pictures of him where he completely, you know, his chin was actually wearing into his chest and causing, you know, an inf infection, he, he, you know, an open wound that remained, you know, for the rest of his life, that type of thing. But in spite of that, he just carried on. Uh, nothing stopped him. Can you speak uh, to his, uh, his moral theology and uh, uh, how priests benefited from that and since then? Right. So, um, St. Alphonse wrote this the moral theology. It's in, in six volumes or five volumes, depending on which set you get. Um, as I said in the beginning, you know, there were, these, there were a whole lot of priests in around Naples and probably around Italy that weren't formed properly. And so they were just priests who would say mass. They would hear confessions. They wouldn't really know what they were doing. And so they were leading souls astray. So he wrote this moral theology in order to uh, instruct primarily his own members of his own congregation, and because there, were, there weren't many books around, and then for any you know, priests uh, throughout Italy and then ultimately throughout the world. Uh, so it was actually a book written by a Jesuit, um, which he then, you know, corrected and, and, and put into to good form and, 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 a, and a more readable uh, method mm -hmm. and has been uh, used, you know, uh, throughout the church. Um, I think it's Pius XII who made him patron of uh, moralists. So mm -hmm. it is, his work is so good that he's the patron of the whole church of moral theology. Um, it's being translated actually at the moment into English, which is the first time. Uh, I just know from the brothers in the seminaries. Um, and, but this, this work, I suppose, as much as it was quite simple, written in Latin, um, he did, he wanted to get it to the priests who wouldn't necessarily have time to read it. And so he wrote another book called Praxis Confessari, The Practice of Confessors. Mm -hmm which was kind of resume of the moral theology of just teaching them how to uh, hear a good confession and lead people in, in the, the right way. But certainly, you know, his, his moral theology has formed, you know, the majority of, of priests, uh, you could say, in the Catholic Church, because it was the standard uh, book. So, you know, he's a patron of moralists and confessors. And uh, I was just speaking to one of the brothers the other day, because we were we've always said that the, the St. Thomas, I think was put on the altar at the, the uh, second, Va uh, at the right. Vatican council in an 80 in uh, 78, whatever it was, um, as being, you know, totally, you can follow it without any problem. You know, every, and St. Francis, you know, understood was put there in kind of the same light that you can follow him, even if you don't understand him. Mm -hmm. But it's not exactly, like that it's that is more is the point that even if you don't understand what you read you can follow his advice and carry on and um so there is that assurity in his writings that you know you almost can't go wrong you know which is it's wonderful sign of, sign of a genius making it tough easy <laughs> yeah exactly yeah um, why did he pick our lady of perpetual health as the uh, icon 
Okay, so it's he didn't actually choose it. There's kind of an anachronism to do with uh, Our Lady of Perpetual Help. Um, he had a great love for Our Blessed Lady, mm -hmm. and um, the image that he actually wrote before was Our Lady of Good Counsel uh, from Scutari in Albania. And Our Lady of Good Counsel, what, he chose her because of the, the title Good Counsel to write the right thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, the image of Our Lady of Perpetual Help comes into the scene after St. Francis has died. It's, um, it comes from, as I say, from Albania. It was, it was brought across the Adriatic Sea to, to Italy and was, there's a whole story about it. I won't go into too much, but basically ended up in a church between St. Mary Majors and John Lateran. Um, and uh, Napoleon was wiping out uh, church and things they so could build big highways through Rome and anyway so this image got into a church between but was hidden and Our Lady wanted it to be exposed and so under Pius the ninth so you know that's the end of the 19th century um, the picture was discovered by the Redemptors who built a church in the place where the image used to be hidden uh, the church of St. Francis and so they applied to Pope Pius the ninth the, for permission to get this image back and promote it. And well, so Pfizer 9 said to them, make her known. And I think, uh, without exaggerating, could say that the image of our mother perpetual help is the most well known image in the whole world. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, they did a good job with that. <laughs> yeah, they certainly did. So that's so, it's Cenophons didn't actually know the image. But what was wonderful is that when they saw the image, it had the uh, you know, are the two angels, St. Michael and Gabriel, holding up the screen, the sponge, and um, no, I'm getting caught up now. <laughs> I should have had a quick look at this. I, I could bring mine out. <laughs> the, the, the cross. Um, okay. And this was the em emblem of the Redemptorist. Uh, that's it, yeah. So the, the, the Redemptorist coat of arms has um, then the spear and the sponge. And the, the, the cross, and so it was. It was a kind of clear sign from Our Lady that this was for the Redemptress and you know, a blessing upon uh, Saint Alphonsus, who had promoted her so fantastically. Oh, nice! Um, speaking of confraternities um, and Our Lady of Perpetual Help, what is the confraternity of Our Lady of Perpetual Help? The significance behind it. Right. Okay. It's just. It's like any, St. Francis wanted, always promoted confraternities and things like that. He said, look, when you get back to the faith, it's not sufficient just to go to confession and, um, you know, get right with God. You've got to nourish that faith. So you've got to have these uh, confraternities, you know, sodalities, all that type of thing, uh, which are vehicles, means to keep you fervent and keep you loving our Lord and, you know, help you to get salvation. So the, the Arch Conference of Mother Perpetual's help is exactly the same. It's just a, it's a confraternity which people can join, which has certain prayers which need to be prayed each day. So you've got that obligation to, you know, to, to nourish your faith, uh, to keep on doing it. Um, and, yeah, it's just to promote devotion to Blessed Lady. She is the um, mother of perseverance. If we want to get to heaven, it's through the grace of perseverance. She's the mother of perseverance. It'll be through her. So it's just one of many different confraternities that there are, which help people to uh, keep their faith, practice their faith, and make the you know, way to heaven uh, united with all those others who are in the arch confraternity and like any arch confraternity there's there's graces and blessings that go with it um the kind of been ch things have been changed with indulgences but the uh, big indulgences for belonging to the arch confraternity and on certain days when you go to mass and and then there's the, what we call the novena of our mother of perpetual help uh which is it's a perpetual novena mm -hmm. um so a novena is normally nine days of something, whereas this is, it's called a novena, but it's actually once a week, and it's just devotions in honor of the mother of, of perpetual help, 
promoted by the Dentists, very big in the Philippines. They have, uh, it's on a Wednesday, and through the day they have these novena sessions, which uh, begins with um, this prayers from Mother Petra Help. There's a, there's a sermon always on it. There's an exposition of the sacrament of blessing. It's kind of in brief. And they have like 12,000 people going to this every single week. Okay, it's called Novena Day in the country. It's Novena Day. The, the cities in this Manila is an absolute mess. They, they have to change the, the way that the, the streets work because the, all the buses are you know, going up to this church of the um, wow. <laughs> Kinsan City, I think it's called. And uh, so and it's, it's part of the whole devotion of the Ashkam Shri, devotion of Blessed Mother. Then there's the same thing in Singapore. They have about 10,000 people going. I visited India. There was, they've got another one in um, there, not as big. But just this, everybody getting together, praying, honoring our Blessed Lady. And so when I talk about the, like the 10,000, it's, it's, they have like 10 sessions mm -hmm. of 1,000 people. So this is huge church they have, getting 10, about 1,000 people. And can you imagine a 1,000 people coming and 1,000 leaving to, <laughs> throughout the day? It's just... <laughs> extraordinary expression of faith in honor of the mother of God and a, a really beautiful thing. Apparently some redemptorists who've, you know, when they've first gone there to preach kind of almost faint at the, the sight of these thousands of people <laughs> really, you know, listening to what you've got to say. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. They're just, it's a great devotion to the mother of God. Of the uh, Now you guys, I'll put the link in the show notes or description section of the confraternity of perpetual help, but, also, the Purgatorian Arch Confer, hey, for my English speaking people, Arch Confer, 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 Confraternity. That quit. <laughs> yeah, Arch Confraternity of, um, yeah, the Purgatorian Arch Confraternity. So that began, if there, there used to be an Arch Confraternity in, for the souls in purgatory. Basically, it's a mass or masses that are offered up every single day for anyone that is enrolled in the Arch Confraternity. And um, it's, just, yeah, it's just offering up prayers every single day, having the mass offered up every single day. And you know, there used to be several masses in the past. We were able to just do one a day. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes we had two. If we've got more priests, we'll do that. And it's just a, a consolation and uh, uh, for f people here to know that every single day the sacrifice of the Mass is being offered up for those souls who are enrolled. And we haven't had to promote this article of fraternity in any way for years now because I believe it's the souls in purgatory that are promoting it. It's amazing how many people want to be enrolled and do get enrolled. And we're not promoting it. Okay, we'll talk about it now. Fine. But <laughs> the reality is we're not, there's no big promotion going on because I believe it is doing so much good that the holy souls themselves are kind of promoting it and inspiring people to get families uh, enrolled in that type of thing. So that is, it's just, it's, it's um, you can enroll yourself as an individual. You can enroll the whole family, which includes three generations, grandparents, grandchildren. Um, and it's just having the mass prayed for them every single day at uh, it's Father Magla in Papa Stranza. He's, he's offering the mass each, each day. And you can begin by enter, uh, joining even when you're alive. So mm -hmm. it begins it's for the living as well as the dead. So if you join as a living member, as soon as you die, there's a special mass offered up and then the masses continue for you after you've died so you don't have to wait in any way until you know you're, you're dead or whatever that you know, really works <laughs> yeah um so it's just that 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 that's what it is and it's it was always blessed by the church and we've been able to carry that on very good um the bonnie prince what's the story behind that the bonnie prince is is father michael mary's um brainchild you could say so we're living in Scotland. We began in Scotland. We're up in the Northern Isles. And we're just wanting to have a specific image that would portray the specificity of our location there in Scotland. And so Father came up with the idea of uh, an image of the infant 
Jesus um, in Scottish uh, clothing. You know, you often see images in like Chinese clothing or this where our Lord has appeared, Our Lady. Um, and so that was the idea, was just to promote him under a special title uh, uh, in, in Scotland. So we just, there was a, we uh, came across an artist actually in America, I think North Carolina. Uh, no, I forget which state, no, Georgia maybe, um, who did the painting for us. And so Father wanted uh, the highlands. So the, the scene of the, the mountains actually is absolutely real. It's mm -hmm. uh, in one of the, the highlands there. He's sitting on the scone stone, which was the, the stone on which all the kings of uh, Great Britain were crowned and uh, Scotland as well. Um, so there's a lot of significance in this. He's wearing the great tartan. Uh, he's wearing the tartan of the Bonnie Prince in Scottish history is Bonnie Prince Charlie, mm -hmm. who was the, the last Catholic king. Um, and so we thought, well, our, you know, our Lord is the Bonnie Prince. You know, he's the, the most extraordinary prince that there is. Uh, and so, you know, we took the title for him and named him the, the, the Bonnie Prince. Okay. Um, I think it's been kind of more clearly stated. We use that shorter title, but he's the 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 Prince of the Highlands and Islands uh, because we got permission from the Bishop of Aberdeen to to, to promote the image. Um, so just to give uh, people uh, a sense of Scotland and a uh, love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Will, will there be a New Zealand one coming? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not, actually. <laughs> So you guys also give uh, the relics of uh, St. Gerard in a, uh, a little band type deal thing? That's right. Uh, okay. So, that... Yeah. So St. Gerard, or Gerard, sorry, I, I speak <laughs> kind of the <laughs> colonial English, but anyway, um, I'll try and use St. Gerard. So he was a redemptress lay brother. You know, how does a redemptress lay brother become the patron of mothers? You know, you thought, well, surely some mother would be the patron of mothers, but he's not. So this lay brother, St. Gerard, who knew St. Alphonsus, lived at the same time as him, became uh, the patron of mothers. And it happened, he's called a wonder worker of the, you know, the, the 18th century. It just worked so many miracles, just extraordinary. Um, his life is just totally and utterly full of miracles. You know, a couple of examples, just like there was a huge ship going, um, floundering in the sea of, of the Bay of Naples, a huge storm. So he walks out on the water, takes a hold of the anchor and pulls the boat in. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, this is just extraordinary miracles. You know, um, he worked so many miracles in the end, the, 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 his priest looked, stop working, I give him obedience to stop working miracles. Okay, so there's this, he's at this work site and someone's falling off a roof. So he says, stop, stop, I'm going to go get permission to <laughs> work a miracle. And so this chap's kind of hanging in the air there <laughs> while St. Jared goes and gets permission to say, can I work this miracle or the chap's going to fall down and die? And says, yeah, okay, you can. <laughs> um, anyway, so St. Gerard was visiting a, a sick young woman, uh, I don't know how old she was, you know, in the, like 16, 17. And um, they knew that he was able to work miracles and you know, heal her. And so he went there and he cured her from the sickness that she was in. And as he was leaving, a handkerchief dropped from his pocket or wherever he was carrying it. And he walked out. And then um, a person of the house ran after him and said, Jared, Jared, you know, you've left your handkerchief. No, your handkerchief's fallen out. So he says, keep it it'll be useful for you one day. And so this girl that he cures is now married and pregnant and having a baby and she's going through this terrible pregnancy, like just mm -hmm. gonna die. And then she remembers the handkerchief of St. Gerard. So she asks for it and she puts it on her and immediately the pregnancy just goes perfectly, the baby's born, no problem, whatever. So there's now this, you know, wow, he's worked this wonderful miracle. So they, they divide the handkerchief up into parts and they're just spreading around to all mothers who, you know, are pregnant, having difficult pregnancy, that type of thing. And it just carried on from there. So then, you know, any relic 
that was of St. Gerard was then, um, you know, given to women who were either wanting to become pregnant or having difficult child pregnancies, births. So we began um, promoting this devotion. So basically we take a linen cloth, which we you know, touch the relic of St. Gerard all over it, and then divide the, the cloth. And, and, and so it becomes a third class relic because it's touched mm -hmm. to the it's a first class relic of his bone. And send it out and extraordinary graces have been won over the years. Um, so many families who haven't been able to conceive um, have applied for the relic and within you know a month or two suddenly they she, the person's pregnant and then they have a big family. Um, pregnancies that have uh, been difficult they've had the pregnant had the relic with them pregnancy's gone fine. One example they were actually doing a scan of the child there was something wrong and as they put the relic to the to to the lady's uh, womb well stomach you could actually see this thing working underneath the scan, you know, correcting itself almost. And the, the, the doctor is absolutely amazed at this kind of visible miracle. So, you know, extraordinary graces, and they just continue to happen um, to do with mothers who are pregnant and you know, that, that whole thing. So that's how that's how it was. Yeah. If you guys get the newspaper, it's in the back. A lot of the stories of this, they, they post them in there. They publish them in me. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, it is great. he's a great saint and, uh, and continues, continues to be uh, the, the patron of mothers. Very good. All right. uh, <clears throat> so, Father, uh, any other concluding thoughts you could think of for Alphonsus, St. Gerard, and your um, redemptors in general for right now? Well, I think just, you know, the, the most important thing, which will always be something I'll come back to is you know, the, the words of our Lord. What is a profit of man to gain the whole world and suffer the loss of a soul? You know, what exchange can a man give for a soul? So it's the last words that St. Alphonsus had on his deathbed. So he, he was dying 90 years old and his one of great nephew came along and said, you know, one last word, what's one last word you can give me before and I leave you. And he just said, save your soul, you know, so that's all that matters. So we're all, we're in a fight, we're in a battle. Um, it doesn't matter what's going on around us as long as we are doing what we can to save our souls. And so that's the work of St. Alphonsus. All he cared about was for someone to get to heaven, to save their soul. And Our Lady is the mother of salvation, the perseverance, and she wants the salvation of us all. So all of these things are just there as means to get us to heaven and, you know, there to you. So, yeah, that's really just really understand the importance of your soul and what a terrible terrible thing it would be to lose your soul for all eternity you know it's a, it's a, it's a thing we actually can't grasp because we're living in time and we're not god we can't understand what this thing of eternity you know to be lost forever it's just the most frightening horrific thing and saint alphonsus his most favorite jack dupree was oh my god do not send me to hell oh my god do not send me to hell oh my god do not send me to hell. so that's all that matters mm -hmm. and you know i'll come back to it again and again <laughs> and you know saint alphonsus says that people in the world promote their lousy literature and the junk again and again and again to, to, to flood the mind with their rubbish and so he says, well, I'm going to flood your mind with good things, good writing, good words. And so <laughs> that's what it is. You're going to hear the same thing again, but it's all well, that matters. Yeah. Yes. So, so we need to hear, we need it a couple of times, slap us across the face every so often. <laughs> and one of his yeah. uh, was a preparation for death. I think he wrote Ecclesiastes, uh, was it 740 all the time? Know thy end and you shall, you'll never sin. Yeah. I, got, I got it framed exactly. up on the wall. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Think of your last end and you'll never sin. Yeah. So it's just trying to put those eternal truths. That's what we call eternal truths before us, have them deeply in our minds and our hearts that they come back to us. So that when the trial comes, the temptation comes, or whatever, we say, well, no, that, that doesn't matter. I've got to save my soul. And, it, and it's a help along the way. So, yeah. It's, it's... All right. Well, again, please help uh, support these guys. They're still building down in New Zealand. Uh, they're still trying to come into the United States. Uh, they have a 501c for 
anybody in the United States. Uh, I'll put the info in the show notes section below if you want to help support that way, along with their calendar, which I, I know these they're, he's on right now, and it'd be like, hey, this is the greatest calendar out there. It is pretty much the best calendar out there. And uh, obviously the newspaper. A lot of people on Instagram and Twitter have been saying they've uh, they subscribed. Thanks. Awesome. Great. Uh, yeah. Tell your friends. I'm going to try to get some more because I got a couple conferences come up, and I'll just pass them out, see if I, if I can get some more. Um, but, yeah, yeah, just uh, keep keep these guys in your prayers and uh, support them any chance you got. Uh, Father, as always, thanks. Uh, yeah, next time we next time we do this, we'll do Glorious of Mary. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Well, thanks very much for having me, Steve, and thanks for the good work that you're doing. And uh, God bless you, class. God bless everybody who's able to listen and help us. Thanks very much. You're welcome. A final blessing, Father. Certainly. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris, Efidii, et Spiritus Sancti, Descendat, Superbos, et Manet Semper. Amen. Amen.